Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our live stream. We are here live at AIDS 2022 in Montreal, Canada. Um, this is the first discussion that we'll be having, one of three for our series, HIV in View. And the name of this discussion is, is HIV still a thing? Growing older with HIV. And I think we can all say yes. In fact, HIV is still a thing. So that's our discussion. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> no. um, so it's important, especially now, as that question tends to get prompted to us in our daily lives more and more, that we come together and discuss what it means to be thriving with HIV today and what unmet needs are prevalent in our different communities and how we can come together to meet those needs. So my name is Raif Tarazi. I am your host, and I would like to introduce our esteemed panel guests. I'll start with Randy. I'm Randy Jackson, and I identify as Nishnabe from Kittle and Stony Point First Nation. I'm an associate professor in the School of Social Work with a cross appointment in health and aging as well. And I've been living with HIV for about 32 years now. Neka? Hi, I'm Neka Nwakolo, and I'm the head of Global Patient Affairs at Deep Healthcare and an HIV physician in London. Lovely. Mercy. Hi, I'm Mercy Shabemba. I'm a young person living with HIV. I've lived with HIV all of my life, um, and I also work for PENTA on youth engagement in clinical trials and research. Okay, so I'll take our conversation to Randy first. Yeah. What, what does thriving with <clears throat> HIV mean to you today? Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm probably like the first cohort that's aging with HIV, and I said earlier that I'm Anishinaabe from, uh, as a, an indigenous person, so my indigenous heritage and culture has a lot to do with how I understand what I go through, including thriving with HIV. Um, and so, um, in that sense, I, under, I understand that, that, um, that developing relationships with my family, my community, help keep me healthy, help keep me thriving. Um, um, and the work that I do really fills me up. Uh, I do a lot of HIV research in Indigenous communities here in Canada. And these are things that, that are really about, for me, thriving. And early on, I mean, when I first tested positive back in 1990, I was, I was like, um, just basically having fun as a young person, right? And, and HIV really woke me up. It became this catalyst to learn how to live well, and, and that's what I did. I decided when I tested positive that, and it was at a time when there wasn't very many treatments, right? And people were dying, like, very quickly around me. And, um, I decided that, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And I decided I was going to go to university. So I enrolled in an undergraduate program at the University of Ottawa. And I did my undergrad degree. And I just kept going. I kept continuing. And I ended up doing my master's and then my PhD. And now I'm a professor. Yeah, so it's amazing when we talk about thriving that these are some of the things that are possible. Yeah, yeah. very inspiring. Yeah. Especially for us younger folk to see someone doing yeah. so well over time. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Um, has your expectations of what you get out of treatment and care changed yeah, yeah. your diagnosis? Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, not only have they changed, but they, I think they've been met too for mo the most part, right? So, like I said, I tested positive really early on in the epidemic and the drugs at the time were really highly toxic. It caused a lot of damage, you know, in my body, including facial wasting, neuropathy in my legs that I continue to live with today. Um, yeah, so, so, so I had that experience, that early experience. And then as the treatment started to improve and those things started to become a less of a concern for me, um, um, the treatments are much less toxic today, much easier to take than, than they were in the past where I would be setting my alarm to get up at four in the morning to take my meds, you know, kind of a thing, mm -hmm. right? That's not what's happening today. And that's a really good thing. Yeah. Neka, do you have anything you would like to add, your perspective to, especially the indigenous community yeah. and what their needs are? Yeah, I mean, there's so much that uh, Randy has said that kind of makes me think and, and want to, to, mm -hmm. to say something. And, you know, you, you said that when you were diagnosed that you it was a catalyst to yeah. do other things. Yeah. And I remember, you know, the time that you were talking about when lots of people were in fact dying. Yeah. And many people sort of made the choice to just say, well, I'm 
I'm going to just stop all the things I was yeah. doing before because I don't know whether I'm going to be here to be able to do them. Yeah. And so they didn't. And then as treatment got better, yeah. they were still alive and still here. And yeah. it was like, oh, oh gosh, yeah. I, I didn't have to have stopped yeah. all the stuff yeah. that I was yeah. planning to do. Yeah, so we had yeah. this journey. Yeah, and I remember really early on being counseled by yeah. physicians that maybe you should retire, maybe you should take care of your mental health. Yeah. Maybe you shouldn't be stressed, and that would advance the, the illness. And I, I just didn't want to live like I didn't want to go on disability. I didn't want to stop living, right? I didn't want to stop doing what I was doing, right? So that's why I continued. Yeah. I didn't want to take that other route. Yeah, no, and, 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 and look yeah. at you now. And, yeah. and now there are, I mean, there are many people like you. Yeah. You know, yeah, people sure. are getting older, um, and getting older healthily yeah um, for, well, for the most part for, for the most part <laughs> and try you know striving to, to be yeah. healthy and to to understand what it is to be healthy yeah. and, and that's that's what we're here to talk about mm. is for the most part yeah. what are what are those differences in, in what we have to deal with in right mm. aging mm. right yeah I mean we've gone from a situation where people where what you were what you wanted to do the most important thing was to stay alive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was just about how you stayed alive, and now mm -hmm. it's about how you live healthily into old age. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Turning to Mercy, um, tell us what thriving with HIV means to you. Yeah, for me, thriving with HIV as a young person living with HIV is being able to kind of hit those goals and milestones that I guess when I first heard about my HIV that I thought, oh, and are, are these things potentially not going to happen in my life and that could be things like going to university or falling in love mm -hmm. and just living the life that you thought you wanted to live but also I think it's really interesting um, in terms of my experience because I've been on medicines before I knew that I was living with HIV so I never kind of had the moment that perhaps Randy talks about in terms of like this is a wake-up call mm -hmm. um, when I got the diagnosis but actually I think for me, it was when I started learning about stigma and experiencing it that that really led me to try and find what it means for me to thrive in a world that can be so hostile and difficult for people living with HIV to actually say, I'm going to put all of that aside and I'm still going to love myself and do the things that I need to do to make sure that I live a long, fulfilled, happy and healthy life. Right. And did you find that you had what you needed to combat things like stigma when you were going through that or did you have to parse through that yourself? I think I did in some senses, but one of um, the things that many young people will experience is, um, particularly if you kind of live in a home where, you know, your parents um, are around and they're, you know, living with HIV, mm -hmm. you can often experience stigma in a double layered sense. So your perception of stigma, but also depending on what they experienced at the time when perhaps they were diagnosed and their kind of historical mm. thoughts. And so it's a really interesting one to navigate because it's not just your journey, but actually it's more of a family journey. And I think I found that quite difficult because I wasn't just navigating my experiences of growing up in the UK with HIV, but actually that context that my parents had and their fears and um, thoughts and also hopes and dreams um, for me kind of going through life. And so that's one thing that I always talk about that it's, yeah, it's a very unique experience because it's quite a collective one and you, yeah. you have to take on, um, yeah, someone else's kind of feelings and thoughts about stigma and, you know, valid experiences and also try and think, how does that fit into my context and how much should that inform the way that I want to thrive and live? Absolutely. And connecting with the younger community, what do you, what do you think that they need to continue thriving with HIV? I think one of the things that I love about this, this discussion is that HIV is still a thing and I find often with other young people who you know, are my peers that actually they're like, oh, like this is still a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think young people definitely need a society that is continuing to be educated about HIV, um, but also you know, specific support to support them to grow older, like, like has already been alluded to. In the early days, it was much more about survival and actually I think there obviously just wasn't space to think about that longevity of life, but I'm 24 now and I have to think about what it's going to be like at 34, 44, exactly. 54, 64, and you know, however long I make it. But I think definitely young people do need support in terms of, yeah, having societies that are ultimately educated, but yeah. also having that longevity in mind about what things should look like. 
Well said. Thanks. Okay, I would love to hear your perspective on this as well. No, I think, Mercy, yeah, uh, it's really important what you're saying, Mercy. And I think that, you know, that you're at 24 thinking about what your life is going to be at 34, 44, 54, realizing that you will live to be beyond that. You know, there, is, there are statistics that suggest that a child born now is likely to live to be 100. So that's a long time. And how do you prepare yourself for that life? And, and, and some of it is about how you live with HIV through that time. But, but a lot of it is just about how you get older as a young person. How do you prepare for getting older? And thinking about it now, not necessarily as a burden, but just, you know, as I get older, as I enter my 40s, and for example, as a woman, things start to happen in your 40s, early 50s, you know, menopause and so on. We don't really talk about menopause very much, although it's starting to be talked about more. But women living with HIV are now going through menopause. You know, when I started doing HIV, menopause was the last thing women used to think about because they were too busy trying to manage their HIV and so on. And now it's like, so how do you live healthily through menopause and into older age? And how do we talk to young women about the fact that they will experience this and how do they prepare for it? Yeah. Exactly. I, I think that's so important. And yeah, I, I always find it funny how, yeah, kind of trying to talk about that with my friends. It's like, but that's so far off. Yeah. But actually, um, that for me is one of the big sort of questions. And I think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done, particularly into younger people um, who have been on, you know, HIV medicines for almost as long as, you know, some people have who are long term survivors. But actually, by the time I get to menopause, I could have been on treatment for like 40 years at that point and actually trying to understand, okay, what will that mean for me physically, but also mentally, spiritually, and kind of, yeah, really trying to figure out, you know, what that will look like um, is a really vital part of, of, yeah, trying to plan for growing older because it is inevitable yeah. and it will happen. And I think, yeah, the more that we can kind of have a collective um, approach, I think the better because I, we know already that women's experiences of menopause um, there's a lot of inequity in it and it's not necessarily a positive experience all around and so that's one thing to be mindful of and to really support yeah our comrades kind of in that space yeah. about we, we want to help you because we're also going to be getting there too yeah, yeah. I know we I, I feel like you're gonna bring it up we talked about it before you and I but personally my experience is has been heavily in fitness and, and natural bodybuilding and and with that comes a lot of supplements to aid in that process. And there's a lot of pushback, I feel like, especially in the healthcare community, regarding accepting supplements and talking to their patients about it. Mm. I get a lot of people that reach out and say, you know, my doctor says I can't take anything. I can't take whey protein, I can't take creatine, none of it. Um, and they won't even give me the time of the day. And I really, really wanna like mm. dive into fitness. And so I'm, I wonder what your perspective is on that. Yeah, no, and, and I think, you know, we're talking about getting older healthily and part of getting older healthily is about exercising and yeah. doing the right kind of exercise I think for your particular period in life and this again comes back to menopause my big pet thing which is you know the sorts of exercise that a 35 year old woman needs and not necessarily the sorts of exercise that a 55 year old woman needs and tailoring that but knowing always that exercise is important mm -hmm. but we know that many people who exercise go to the gym do take supplements of, of some kinds, and we know that some supplements may interact with some kinds of antiretroviral therapy. So it's really important that if you're thinking about taking supplements that you speak to uh, your healthcare professional, your doctor, your nurse, to just check that, that they're okay. And sometimes it's a matter of separating the supplements from your um, antiretroviral therapy rather than uh, not taking them at all. But it's really important to get advice from uh, a doctor, a healthcare professional about whether you can take them and, and, and so on. But ultimately, it's really important to remember that exercise is really a really important component of uh, being healthy and, and staying healthy. And expanding on that a little bit and getting a little specific, we're, we're here at this conference. We're surrounded by all these HCPs and, and VIV and organizations. What, what can VIV specifically and what can other HCPs do to aid in meeting these unmet mm -hmm. needs? I think the first thing that we at Vive, but also at, uh, HCPs in general, mm -hmm. uh, need to do is to, to hear what people need. So to go out and ask people, 
What is it that you need? How can we help you? Because it's only in understanding what you need that we can think about how, how to help you. So I think, I think we just need to, to, to be there to, to ask questions and also for people to come to tell us, you know, so and have a sort of two-way dialogue as to what your needs are and, and as to how we might be able to help support those needs. Randy, Neka, from your perspective, what do you think that HCPs and Beeve in particular can do to help us? Oh my God, yeah. I mean, we are thinking about the indigenous community yeah. thriving with HIV in the context of continuing colonialism is really problematic, right? And that's a big issue for anybody to address. And whether it even ever gets tackled, who knows? But what we do know and what can be supported is, is sort of targeted uh, programs that, that, that use, that mobilize culture to keep one's healthy. Because this, this, is, this is the really, really important thing that helps you to yeah, I thrive in the context of these continuing challenges like, you know, and poverty, colonialism, all those things that we talk about as being determinants of health. I mean, these are, are big issues to, to, to address. And so, I mean, we continually hear in, in many of my research projects that, that, that people uh, go out on the land to, to heal, they participate in ceremonies. Um, all of this requires access, money, those kinds of things. And these are, these are things that, that can be used to support people to keep indigenous people's healthy because when you when they're participating in ceremony and they're participating in their culture they're living their identities they're in a much better place mentally emotionally to think to themselves okay I can I can commit to going onto this drug for however long I need to be on it right it gets them into that place I think and I think that that's that's that that's something that can be supported fully by by the and and, and a commitment to work to end colonialism with us yeah yeah. My, my point is completely linked as well. I think recognizing the social and economic and political determinants of what it means to thrive is really important. And I would urge everybody to not work in silos yeah. because mm -hmm. it is so important to recognize the impact that the environment you live in will yeah. have on whether you, you can't even thrive. I mean, self-care will only ever go so far and doing things for ourselves mm. as a community will ever yeah. only ever go so far mm. if the environment we're living yeah. in is you know still yeah. oppressive um, and subjecting us to yeah systems and uh, institutions that are set up to not work for us and so mm. that would that would be my thing that actually whilst individual thriving is really important it has to be a push for the collective to be able to thrive yeah. and that's about building yeah. um, societies and nations and a world that actually can support thriving and not work against it. Absolutely. I feel like we could go into any of these topics for an hour alone. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to the International AIDS Conference. Thank you to Vive Healthcare. Thank you at home for watching and it's so important that we, like you said, come together from our diverse backgrounds to have mm. these discussions because we really are entering unknown territory and the only mm. way we're going to move forward and under, have a better understanding is if we come together. Um, so thank you so much. Oh, and don't forget, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll have our second discussion, another big one, stigma, 40 years later. <laughs>